Here in chapter 5 of the book of Mark, we, we continue to see Jesus as he demonstrates the authority, he demonstrates the love, and he demonstrates the rule of the kingdom of God. That's how he began his first words there in the gospel of Mark, where the kingdom of God is at hand, it's now. And last week we saw Jesus, well, in a storm with his men. And today, He'll not be ruling or quieting a storm, but he'll be dealing with demonic forces. And, and I want you to let me have your attention for a second. Some people say, John, demons, demonic forces, wasn't that a first century way of describing mental illness or psychotic behavior? I mean, isn't that kind of like the Salem uh, witch hunts or trials or Haitian voodoo or Halloween costumes with pitchforks and, you know, pointy tails and horns. I mean, you really believed in demonic forces? Well, I think one of the greatest deceptions Satan ever pulled off was to convince the world, or, or you or I, that he doesn't exist. Because he does. There's no way you can seriously read the Bible and not see that Satan is real. I mean, it starts in the very first book of the Bible, where, where man is tempted by the enemy, where he's lied to and deceived. The Bible begins with the fall. It begins with the temptation. And, and it begins with Satan right, well, right off the bat. In fact, in 33 separate places in all four Gospels, and, and the book of Acts, we are told explicitly the reality of demons and satanic forces. Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 2, I throw this verse up here, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You mean my problem's not with you? I thought it was. No, it, it says we, we, we're wrestling against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places. So, so I want to start off like this. You and I have a real enemy. There's spiritual darkness. And, and there is attacks that come our way. There's a story about a little girl who was disciplined and corrected by her mother. She, she pushed her younger brother to the ground and then she kicked him. And the mom came on the scene and said, well, honey, the devil made you do that. And she said, I'm not so sure, Mom, the girl said. The devil might have made me push him down, but I thought of kicking him all by myself. <laughs> you might have kids like that. Some characteristics are signs of the enemy wanting to dominate or destroy your life. I, I want you to listen. As, as I read our text today, and then I want to describe some of the things that the enemy not only did to this individual, but loves to do in a person's life, demon-possessed or not. In chapter 5, verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he came out of the boat, speaking of Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He'd been dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, or even with chains. He had been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains he had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran, and he worshipped him. And he cried with a loud voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. 
some of the things the enemy wants to do in your life and my life are, are seen in the life of this man who has been, well, controlled by the enemy. Number one, he wants to isolate you. He, he, he wants to cut you off physically, emotionally, and spiritually from others and from the truth. He wants to take you and, and, and isolate you from influences that have to do with truth and with the Word of God. Th this man lived among tombs. He may have said, like many people say, I don't need other people. I don't need church. I don't need community. He, he lived among the physically dead. He lived among tombs isolated. Number two, the enemy wants to bring self-destruction into your life. Night and day, he's crying out and cutting himself, wandering around in the dark. Uh, Satan will fill your head. And I think we're seeing this more and more in our culture today with self-hatred, with suicidal thoughts, with desire to bring pain on yourself instead of peace self-loathing, and self-condemnation. Not, not only does he want to isolate you, but then he wants to bring you physical and spiritual and emotional harm. That's part of his game. He also wants to put you in an unclean place. He, will, he lived among dead corpses. He, he, he was in an unclean situation. And, and I would define that in our culture today if he wants to, to fill your life with drug abuse, with pornography, with sexual perversion, with obscenity, morally and physically unclean. That, that's where he's headed. He, he, he wants to bring a person into isolation. He wants to bring them in self-destruction, uncleanliness, and, and have you live a life without peace, without joy, and without hope. This is the case of this man here in the Gospel of Mark. We've seen the impact of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, calling people to greater purpose and depth in life, a life not just centered on self, restoring hope. We saw him restore hope to a leper, a man who was certainly unclean and an outcast. We, we saw him heal a, a man with a withered hand. And that, that hand probably represented occupation and work and uh, all, all kinds of things in that culture, that situation. He healed a useless paralytic who couldn't stand, he couldn't walk, he couldn't work. In those days, it would have been total isolation. They brought him to Jesus and he, he was given a whole new life because the kingdom of God had come. And here's the contrast, here's the stark contrast, if you will, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Here you see Jesus bringing hope and life and restoration and renewal. And here in chapter 5, you see the enemy bringing isolation, you see him bringing self-hurt, and you see him bringing no hope, no joy, no peace. In John chapter 10, you have this verse, the thief, speaking of Satan, does not come except to steal from you, to kill, to destroy. And Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and they might have it more abundantly. Jesus had just given the disciples a, a picture in the last part of chapter 4 of his power an understanding of who he is over nature, the storm, he, he, he calmed the sea. And now we see his power over evil. And, and both of these stories answer the question asked of Jesus in the boat as, as he was there in the storm. In Mark chapter 4, verse 38, it says, He was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care? And I think that's a question that bounces around in the hearts and the minds of a lot of people as we go through storms, as we navigate life. Lord, don't you care? 
I wouldn't ask you to raise your hand, but I bet everyone in this room at one time or another in the midst of a storm or a situation in life have wondered, God, don't, don't you care about this? Don't you see what's going on? I'm sure Moses must have asked that question. I mean, spared as a young child when, when the Pharaoh was having all the Hebrew boys put to death. He finds himself growing up in the palace, heir to the throne of Egypt, possibly. And now suddenly he's isolated in the desert, tending sheep cut off from his family and his friends for, for 40 years. Can you imagine or think that maybe Moses said once in a while, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that I'm out here? A away from what you had given me and what you had rescued me from? Or, or how about Daniel being thrown in the lion's den? Can you imagine the thoughts and emotions growing through his head as he looked down in there and they said, yeah, toss him in. The roar of the lions, I think, and I would be thinking, Lord, don't you care? Or Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they said, stoke the fire seven times hotter, hotter than normal. And it says the strongest soldiers tied them up. I mean, talk about isolated. The king looked in the fire after they'd been thrown in and said, who's the other guy in there? He looked like the son of man. The Apostle Paul, beaten, shipwrecked, imprisoned, stoned, over and over and over again. And he even had a thorn in the flesh, some kind of physical thing. But he also had this amazing grace and peace and revelation of his presence and power in his life. And I'm sure there were times when the Apostle Paul must have said, Lord, I've been praying over and over about this thorn. Don't, don't, you, don't you care about what's going on? How about Adam hiding, naked, ashamed, and God comes looking for him? And Jesus comes looking. That's what we find here in chapter 5. Jesus comes looking for a man who's isolated, a man who's trapped, The problem is, is the enemy comes looking too. And, and he knows our weaknesses. He, he knows those points in our life. You know, I, think of, I think of King David. He's at the top of his game. Man, he not only slew one giant, he slew many. And, and he's king of all Israel. He, in fact, he doesn't even have to go to battle anymore. He, he's got the nation under control. The borders are extended as far as they've ever been before. But the enemy knew David had a problem with women. And so when David was at ease, when he was at peace, he walked up these stairs, he saw a beautiful woman. And the enemy knows your weakness. Oh, he, he's come to kill, to steal, and, and, and destroy, and, and he, 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 he trapped David. I loved what I heard one pastor say about David's sin. You know, he goes up those stairs to the balcony and sees Bathsheba. He said, you know, those same stairs that took him up there were the same stairs that could have taken him back down. But he lingered. Do you remember when Jesus showed up looking for you? When he, when he came... To, to find you. I don't know what kind of situation you were in. Were you isolated? Were you, were you trapped in something? Were you, what, what was it that he came looking for you? L listen to what Jesus did for people in the city of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll have a couple of... He says, Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is the Apostle Paul. He says, don't be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous. Not that these are in any kind of order of what's worse. They're all worse. Drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But, but then he goes on and says this. But such 
were some of you. This is the way we were. That's what he says. But you're washed, you're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. He says, look, Jesus came looking for you. It used to be like this. Now you're washed, now, now you're clean. So, so Jesus comes ashore here at the, at the gathering. It, it's an area that on the other side of the lake from Capernaum where Gentiles gathered as well as Jews. And he sees a man trapped by the enemy. I mean, he's, he's trapped. A man that's been created in the image of God, loved by God, but trapped by the enemy. You know, I used to tell my kids, you've probably heard me say this, I would say that to the, this to them almost every morning when we do, do this little devotion together before I take them to school. I would say, God has a plan for your life, but so does the enemy. So does the enemy. And you'll choose every day whose plan you follow. God has a plan. And all of us know, and the scripture declares that there's pleasure in sin for a season. We don't know how this man got to where he is. But somehow, somewhere, at some time in his life, he started down a dark road. A road of uncleanliness. Maybe a, a road of, of witchcraft or sorcery. Or maybe he found himself in, in that culture with many gods because of the Roman domination, worshiping the god of Bacchus, which was the god of drink, the god of drunkenness. Maybe socially at first it was, it was a great thing, a lot of fun. Maybe he used pharmacia, drugs, or both. And you can open your life to a realm of influence. And it can be fun and pleasurable at first. The Bible says it is. There's pleasure in sin, but it says for a season. I mean, ask any alcoholic. Oh, yeah, it started off fun. I used to drink it. You know, pretty soon I needed more to drink every day before it would even bother me. And then, then more and more, and pretty soon I couldn't live without it. And they're trapped. You know, I, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. I know I look a lot younger than that. But the cool thing to do in the 60s and 70s as you were growing up, and I was 16, 17 in that era, the cool thing to, to do in those days, the hip thing to do was drugs. Any of you guys remember drugs? <laughs> Marijuana. No, oh, I was introduced to it when I was probably 14. My brother was 17, so I hung out with him. He was a cool surfer. And so I got into this older group of guys before I realized, and next thing I know, yeah, I'm smoking marijuana. Who wasn't? All the people around me were. But I, but I didn't know that it would lead to LSD. I said, oh, I'll never do LSD. I'll never do LSD. I'll ne Famous last words. Next thing I know, I'm living in... Uh, Delaware at 16 years of age in a surf shop with a couple of my buddies, and we think we're the coolest guys in the world. We got long hair. We got beads. We're, we're living in a surf shop. We're surfing every day. We're being paid to surf. And the guy who owned the shop, who paid for us to be there, one afternoon after a surf contest, he came to us in this little hotel in Cape May, New Jersey, and we had smoked marijuana with him a lot. And he said, hey, you guys want to try something else? I thought he was talking about going to Dairy Queen. I go, what do you got? He goes, well, this is called Orange Sunshine. Don't act like you've never heard of it. What is that? He goes, oh, it's just, it's just, it, it, I said, well, will it mess up my surfing tomorrow in the Contest? Oh, no, you'll be fine. Well, that was a lie. I was up all night. And the strange thing about drugs in the 60s and 70s was you bought this stuff from people off the street that you didn't even know. 
Yeah, this is Jimmy, man. He, he's good. Who's Jimmy? There are consequences to choices. Uh, you know, I thought, man, I'm going to go to Delaware, and the main goal was to surf in the East Coast Surfing Championships and win a bunch of contests. And we, we surfed, guess how many contests we surfed that whole summer? One. And that was the night he gave me the orange sunshine. I set out my, I made it to the finals, and I don't even know what I did out in the finals. I was so hungover for the night before. And after that, it was just a party every weekend. My older brother, Yancey, who was in, involved in, in pro surfing, came through Delaware. And the first question he asked me was, John, how many contests have you placed in and won? I said, oh, we're, 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 we're not surfing in contests, man. He goes, what? That's why you came up here. Now, we're just surfing the inlet and the acetate. We're just hanging out. And he goes, what are you talking about? And myself and my two buddies and this other guy, we were just lost. And, and there's consequences to choices. Ask those people in prison, how'd you end up here? Ask those people who are estranged from their children or their families or, or they've lost their careers or they've lost their marriages. Yeah, the book of Hebrews says there's pleasure in sin. For, for a season. Here, here in the Gospel of Mark, it says, always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he worshiped him and he cried out with a loud voice, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said, come out of him. And then he asked him, what's your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. So here's a guy who, who's possessed by a demon. And, and, and a simple definition is when a demon spirit resides in a human body and can show its presence and personality through that person. This is what's going on here. They desire to dominate, to destroy that which has been made in the image of God. You say, well, I don't know if I've ever encountered someone like that. Well, I don't believe demons can inhabit Christians. I don't think that's biblical. But they do want to deceive Christians. They do want to condemn Christians. They do want to blind them with fear and unbelief and isolation. L listen to the story. My name is Legion, for, for we are many. And he begged him that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine were feeding near. So all the demons begged him, send us into the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. The unclean spirits went out, entered the swine, and there were about 2,000 swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now, Roman legion was around 6,000. I'm not sure this guy had 6,000 demons. I think the idea is there's many, not just one. Maybe he responds that way to Jesus because he thinks he can intimidate Jesus by the number and the power. Charles Spurgeon said, Satan would rather destroy a swine than do no harm at all. He's so fond of evil and destruction, he, he, he would work upon an animal if not a man. And so he called Jesus and asked him if he could do that. So this man is delivered. The, the swine apparently couldn't handle the evil that inhabited them, and so they self-destroy themselves. So in those who fed the swine, in verse 14, as we continue our story, they told it to the city and in the country, and they all went out to sea 
what it was that happened. So, so the people who saw these pigs go off the ledge, off the mountaintop, well, they went into town, they went in the country, they're telling everybody what's going on out there near the sea. And they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed, who had the legion, and they see him sitting, clothed in his right mind, and they, it says, were afraid. They're afraid. There's no more demons. But, but, but they're afraid of, of something they don't understand, of something they're, they're, they're visually seeing. This man was crazy. He was wild. He was out there. And now he's sitting here clothed in his right mind. Once he was violent and restless and chained. Now, now sitting clothed, not roaming in the tombs. Before, they, they, they couldn't control him physically and mentally. He seemed obviously whacked. But now he's in his right mind. There's a before and after picture of this guy. It's like Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. There's a great verse. Says, you once walked according to the course of this world. You once walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in disobedience, but no longer. That's who you once were. That, that's a true statement for every believer. You were once like that, but you're not like that anymore. And the people from the city show up and see a totally transformed man and a missing herd of swine. So they came to Jesus, verse 15. They saw the one who had been demon-possessed. And they're afraid. It's the same word that we had in, in Mark chapter 4, verse 41, when it said, The disciples feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And they were afraid. They're thinking... I mean, just like you and I would if we showed up on this scene. How in the world did he do this? We chained him. We isolated him. And, and the death of the swine was, was evidence of spiritual power. That something happened. And that this man is sitting in front of them in his right mind. There's fear, there, there, there's misunderstanding, there, there, there's this sense of loss, and we've lost these sheep, the, these swine, I mean, there's selfishness. And the easiest solution they can come up with, in verse 17, they began to plead or beg with Jesus that he leave their region. So, verse 18, he gets in the boat. And he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. This guy wants to go with him. I mean, I can understand that. No one ever showed him this kind of attention, this kind of love. No, no one ever brought this kind of thing into his life where he could be free from this. I mean, if Jesus did that for you, wouldn't you want to go with him too? I would. I mean, if I've been roaming the, the tombs naked and cutting myself and isolated and, 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 and tormented all the time and someone came along and freed me from all of it and suddenly I'm in my right mind, I would say, Jesus, can I go with you? Don't leave me here. I mean, he's been set free. This man has been shown amazing compassion and power and he has seen the kingdom of God that's come to him in love and grace and mercy. But Jesus says, no, you, you, can't, you can't go with me. In fact, in verse 19, he did not permit him. He said, I want you to go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. See, if Jesus had taken him with him, back across to Capernaum, nobody would know this guy. He's just a guy from across the lake. He looks like everybody else now. 
Now, there's no big testimony in Capernaum with this guy, but if he stays where he is, everybody knew the crazy man who lived out there by the sea, who, who lived among the swine in the tombs and cut himself all the time. So Jesus says, no, no, you, you need to stay here. Because I would imagine most everyone in the town talked about or knew this man. In some ways, if you read the Gospels, he's the first missionary to the Gentiles almost the first missionary Jesus ever sent out. Imagine that. The first missionary of Jesus was a gathering demoniac that had a legion of demons. Would that have been your first missionary? Hey, there's a guy on the other side. I think he'll make a good missionary. The, the people of the town got their request, Jesus, go away. The demons got their request, send us into the swine. Okay. But the healed man... The delivered man, he says no. And sometimes it seems like the enemy does his thing. And you're thinking, wow, how does the enemy get away with this? Or, or how do unbelievers that seem to be thriving? And Lord, what about me? I'm sure it must have felt that way for him when he said yes to the demons, yes to the townspeople, but no to him. Now, we're, we're not told what happened as he goes home. Did, did he leave home as a prodigal? Was he 16, living in a surf shop? How, how did it start? Did, did he shame his parents like the prodigal who left and took, took his, uh, you know, his, his, his inheritance early, which would have been a shame to the, to the father, to the mother, and just go live? I don't know. Was he married? Did he have kids? Did his wife see him coming down the road and said, oh my gosh, don't let him back in the house. I changed the locks. And maybe he said, honey, I, I, I've changed, I've changed, I've met Jesus. Hmm. See, see here, here's this story. Listen, here's this story. Why is this story in the Bible? Well, I, I think it's in the Bible because there's people today who struggle with isolation. There's people today that the enemy is, is tempting and drawing and, and, and speaking to and deceiving and, and wants to bring them into loneliness, wants to bring them into to a thought life that's unhealthy, that's condemning wants to drag people into drugs. N nothing probably compared to where this guy ended up. So, so I think maybe part of the reason we have this story is if Christ can cleanse and change and transform this man, he, he can do that for you. He can do it for me. Uh, we know statistically today that in our culture that suicide and isolation and confusion, well, it's stronger than it's ever been. And, and there's no reason for us to even read this story or this Bible if Jesus doesn't still save and transform and care, right? The kingdom of God, he says, has come. It's come to set people free. We, we've seen it all through the gospel of Mark over and over and over again. When Jesus steps on the scene, people are set free and delivered and healed and restored because he offers freedom. Jesus offers freedom, not chains. That's part of the story. And we can find ourselves in this world we live in chained to a lot of different things. He, he offers relationship and community, not isolation. He, he set this guy free from his chains and sent him back into his hometown, back to his family, back to his friends. And you know he, what he did it with? An amazing testimony. Can you imagine meeting that guy? Hey, are you that guy that was in the tombs? Yeah, look at the cuts all over my arms. I used to cut myself. I used to have demons. Well, tell me what happened. Oh, you want to know what happened? The kingdom of God has come through a person named Jesus Christ. 
And if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Sure, sure people enjoy swine. That's part of the story here. Pleasure of sin. People are afraid to trust the Lord. And, and like these people in this community, they say, Jesus, go away. We like our life the way it is. And there's a lot of people who turn him away. That's obvious. But there are those who want help. There are those who come to him. There are those who, who need him. There are those who open their lives to Christ and he changes them. He says, I, I, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. And I've shared this many, many, if you would have told me at the age of 16, a high school dropout, a surfer who's living in a surf shop, using drugs, if you say, you know, John, one day you'll be standing on a platform in your right mind, sort of, sharing the scripture. I'd go, are you crazy? You're the one who doesn't have the right mind. But, but here, here's, a, here's an old hymn, maybe you've heard it. And maybe this is for you. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals of heaven, he's waiting and he's watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home. You who are weary, Come home, earnestly, tenderly. Jesus is calling. Calling, O sinner, come home. And he showed up at that man's door, and he called him to himself. And I would submit to you that his life was never, ever again the same. And if you're here today and you're struggling with isolation or self-loathing or, or, or self-pain uh, in some way and the enemy's been, been trying to, 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 to take you down, if you're, if you're somehow trafficking and uncleanliness, be it drugs or pornography or sexual perversion or obscenities physically, morally, he, he says softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, come home. Come on. And, and, and if I could, you know, s s close with this. You know, one of my, my, my last desires when I became a Christian, I got totally changed. And my first thing was, okay, I'll go back to high school because I broke my mom's heart. She wants to see me finish. I'll do it. Because my mom had done so much for me. She raised five kids for many years as a single mom, working two jobs. And so once I realized I wasn't super cool, that I broke my mom's heart, that I was just a jerk of a teenager, I said, okay, I can go, I can go back to high school for mom. I was a changed person. And then suddenly I ended up in Bible college, which was like, what am I doing here? These are weirdo religious people. And after four years there, my last year, I met my wife. Then I went off to seminary for three years. I mean, I have a master of divinity. I've mastered the divine. <laughs> I don't know where they came up with that term, master of divinity. No one can master divinity. And then the last place I wanted to come back to was here. My brother was a big surf star. I, I didn't want to be in his shadow. I want to go somewhere else and maybe start a church or do something. And, and out of circumstance, God brought me back to Gulf Breeze, which at that time was a one red light little town. So I'm not going back there. And for some reason, the Lord said to me, I want you to go back and tell people what great things the Lord has done. And that's been my life, because softly and tenderly, Jesus called me. 
He says, oh, sinner, come home. And you might be here today and he's calling you. You might say, oh, go away, Jesus. We don't want you. And man, many do that just like in this story. But then some recognize their true need. And they find themselves set free and then sent by him to be on mission for him. What an amazing thing Jesus can do in the life of a person who says, I'm coming home. 